Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop. Amazing to have you here. We're working on the Trihander. Today is episode 13. And I'm gonna get cracking, pulling the sword out of the handle, and then grinding on the handle, starting to get it to shape, while Will uses a die grinder and some carbide burrs on the inside of the guard loops. The new guard loops. Because we broke the first guard loops off. Let's jump in. Alrighty, our piece of wood fits all the way up there. It's gonna interface nicely with the pommel, and so all that needs to be done is the final shaping of the handle. I'm gonna try and keep it a little bit stouter on this go around. Will has been making marvelous process here on the guard. You also, I, you got, I see you got taped gloves. Yes, because having those slivers fall down your sleeves is literally the worst thing in the planet. Will, bang up job. This is outstanding. This You're is right. my life now. I guess You're I just stuck with the I gloves. Just, just have gloves on all the time. I. What do you reckon? I think this is about time for us to go into the forge. I think you are correct. Well, well actually, first I think that it needs to have the other pieces made. That's that's a very valid point. If it was not abundantly clear to you, what I have here is we have a guard with this. This is a scarf. I know. It doesn't look like a scarf. Frankly, it would probably be quite painful. It's actually a forge welding scarf. And it means that we get a nice solid joint when we forge weld it. We're gonna be forge welding it because we need to attach the ends with the balls onto this. Of course, we turn the balls in the lathe. There's no way we get this in the lathe. And so the ball ends need to be made separate unless it was that I was gonna thread the balls in. I decided I didn't wanna thread the balls in. But let's explain how a scarf works. It's gonna end up looking like this. We're gonna cut another piece of steel with a ball on the end, and it's gonna have this upset and forged down scarf, which is gonna interface with the scarf from our guard, and you see how they meet up here. When they do meet up, you end up with all this extra material. Now the thing about forge welding is forge welding is better the more you hammer on it at welding temperature, it helps fuse those two separate pieces of steel together. So what you want is you want a lot of thick material so that you have plenty of hammer blows to strike before it's in its final bar form. The tapers at the end of the scarf are so that you can neatly blend in the end of one piece of steel into the, uh, the trunk of the other. Scarf welding like this, is no easy feat. If you want to watch some folks that are really good at scarf welding, check out Mark Asbury on YouTube. Also check out my good friend Joey van der Steeg, who is from the Netherlands. He actually came and hung out with us at the old workshop in Norfolk in England. What did we do then? We did all sorts of fun stuff. That was when I was trying casting for the first time. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do a very mediocre and amateur attempt at scarf welding. Now gonna jump in without any practice on a project that we've already spent two days working on. And hopefully, what sounds stupid, which is that, ends up being a success. So, we're gonna make ourselves some pieces with some balls, with some scarfs. Here we go. Operation number one is going to be forging down this piece here, getting that nice diagonally forged square swoop 
before we cut it off in the middle. And while we cut it, we're gonna be creating the taper of our scarves. We're gonna cut it with a fat chisel, and that's gonna create that scarf taper ready for us to forge into the final scarf on both halves. Delta, that is looking gorgeous. And you finished the second guard already, right? Yep, second guard's all finished. Will, outstanding work. This looks gorgeous. Handle number two is a success so far. You know what, I think three's gonna be even better. Let's just go for it. I think the fifth. I think we should actually just start on the fifth right now. So I guess the next step for you is getting the pin in there and finishing up the pommel. That's it. I get to use some files. He finally gets reunited with his second best friend after hand sanding paper, the files. I think I melted it. I think I really melted it. I think it's melted. Oh my goodness. Ah, look, it's melted. Oh my. I have melted the ball. Oh, it might be okay. It might be okay. It might have just been slagged from the bottom of the forge. Oh, I think it was just smooth from the forge. False alarm. We're all good. So, the forge weld went really quite well. I'm very happy with how the forge weld went. As you can see, it's blended in really nicely in all but one little corner where that little toe there hasn't blended in. We'll be able to sort that out. The worry I have right now is the inertia of hammering on this at this little stress concentration in the transition between the ball and the bar. It's got the ball flopping about. When you flop a piece of steel about in a very small section, you're bound to break it. I don't want that happening. So I want a way to secure the ball while we hammer on this, and I have an idea. That idea is to stuff that gap with tightly wrapped wire. We don't need forge welding temperatures in this area anymore, so I don't need to worry about the wire sticking to it. So I'm gonna jam a load of wire in there, wrap it all around, see if that keeps this secure while we do the final forging down here. Miraculously, it's together. The ball is still attached. It has not fallen off just yet. The weld worked. We were able to forge it down on the diagonal under the power hammer. That's one of the fortunes of having worked it on the diagonal. Next step is taking ball end number two and sticking it on the other side and doing the exact same thing all over again. The toe of that weld has not welded up. Mess that up, so that's not good. I'm gonna take a file or a rasp to it, or go to the grinder. I'm basically gonna grind in here and see if we can bypass the unwelded material.
the toe of the other end of the world has opened up as well. That's no good. It's the next morning, we had to stop for the day, but we're gonna get right back into it. know all about this. It's your last touch on a project. The last one. You told yourself it's the last one. No doubt in your mind that it's the last one because it's the last hammer blow. <laughs> I was done forging. It has fallen off. This was what I was worried about. I talked about this earlier. There's a concentrated area of stress right there. We wrapped it with wire, which did marvelously to prevent it from oxidizing and stop it flopping too much, but it hath flopped its last flop. It flopped too much. The wire could not help it. That's okay. It's gonna be fine, guys. We're gonna survive. I know exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna survive. The rest of the guard is all good. What we're gonna do is we're gonna turn up another ball that's threaded. We're gonna drill and tap into the end of the guards. And we're gonna just thread the balls in. It's gonna be a really easy way of doing it. And it would have saved us a lot of time if that had been something that we'd thought of in the first uh, way that we went about doing this. Thank you, YouTube commenters. You have indeed educated me. Because it was comments from you lovely folks down below that made me think about that. Sometimes you make decisions and you go with them. My decision was I was going to make the two pieces with the balls on the end and I didn't properly consider the effect of needing to forge so much with balls hanging on the end and I should have. I should have known better but I did not. I have to leave the workshop for a couple of hours to go to a doctor's appointment so I don't know what's gonna happen next but I'm sure Will is gonna do an admirable job of helping make some more progress on this guard or whatever he is working on. I'm going to go ahead and step back and work on the blade again. Now it is at a pretty good finish right now, but it's gotten a little bit scratched up, so I'm gonna go back through, refinish it at 400, get everything taped off, ready to fit up the guard once he's finished with it. Alrighty folks, so the next step is we're gonna take to the grinding room and we are gonna grind in the continuation of these 45 degree bevels up to here. It's gonna look rather beautiful. See how that looks.
one etched blade. Is that what I hear coming right up? Oh my goodness! That is insane! Wow! This is hugely exciting. The blade has been etched. We're neutralizing it. And the pattern is just out of this world. Out of this world! Where is this pattern, Will? Uh, not Mars. I was gonna make you a this joke, but I feel like that's probably an inappropriate idea. <laughs> Hugely exciting stuff! That is soon gonna be finished up with a 2,000 grit hand sanded finish to polish up the highs, keeping the lows dark. We're very excited. What you saw me do down here on this piece, is I went to the forge to hammer on it some more to make sure that we were able to give this a forged texture. That, ladies and gentlemen, is called cheating. Much like the old adage, a grinder and paint will make a welder what he ain't. And it's more like a grinder and heat will make me the blacksmith of the week. <laughs> it's just appalling, oh my goodness. That was really bad, sorry. That's so bad. Okay, guys, I think that's the, that's the end of the day. That's it. <laughs> In other news, folks, I wanna show you something pretty hilarious. Look at that, that's the inside of our forge right there. And that is a whole load of rubble from the roof of the forge. I think I just had the forge cooking so hot that the refractory didn't like it because I had that forge a cranking I don't think I've ever had the forge quite so hot. So the forge has fallen apart a little bit We do need to fix that. So clearly we can't build our forges very well. They fall apart But you know who does build the heating devices incredibly well? That's right our sponsor Paragon down in Texas, they build a mighty fine heat treating oven. This is one of our KM Pro ovens that they have supplied us with. It has ceramic baffles, integrated heating elements, a three zone triple thermocouple design, meaning that you get the most even heat through the whole length of the oven as possible because they're independently controlled zones. Meaning you open the door, you dump heat out of the front side, you're not all of a sudden overheating the tip to compensate for the overall loss of temperature in the whole thing. Right here, we have a smaller KM9 Pro oven. It's nine inches deep. It's a double wide version and both of these feature their Sentinel Smart Touch Bartlett Control Systems touch screen. Control meaning that with the touch of a button you can go ahead and adjust exactly what you want into your program. You can go ahead and start it and because of those ceramic baffles, easy peasy, this thing is going to heat up super fast. It also means it's going to cool down way faster than its fire brick lined counterpart. These ovens are fantastic and Paragon is constantly innovating the products that they provide. This is their 50 inch tall modular vertical heat treating oven and without it we wouldn't have been able to pull off such a good job of heat treating the Tsvai Hender. It was hanging there and it stayed so much straighter than it possibly could have any other way and we had a beautiful consistent heat as we went into that quench as well as when we did the tempers. So a big thank you is owed to Paragon for sponsoring this show, being such great supporters of the knife making industry, producing such great products. I really hope that your next oven is a Paragon heat treating oven and so Go check out the link in the description below. Find a distributor and make sure that you add one of their phenomenal bits of kit to your arsenal and let them know I sent you. Big thank you as ever to all of you for coming along and us being able to share this journey with you. See you very soon. Bye-bye.